Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Perfect. All right. So like Beth said, um, I'm Heather Casca, and I'm so excited to be here this morning and share all of this wonderful information with you and hopefully answer um, some questions. So I, I promise we'll leave plenty of time to um, get to some questions. Um, I'm especially excited to be um, presenting today alongside Dr. Anna Sosa. Um, she was my professor in grad school, so it's really exciting for me to be able to be here um, alongside her today talking about something that is um, very near and dear to both of our hearts, I know. Um, we're going to start by just kind of going over some brief uh, just information and introduction on speech and um, language disorders and kind of going over that role. And then we'll conclude with Anna sharing her perspective as a parent and then we'll um, get right to the questions. So I think we have a poll um, for the first and we just wanted to get an idea of who is in um, the audience today. So if you guys just wanna click so we can see who's here with us today, um, it's okay if you click on more than one. Awesome, so lots of parents, some SLPs like some students. Awesome, good. Yay, we're, we're so excited to have um, all of you guys, all of you guys here joining us today. I'm gonna click out of that. Okay, so um, we're gonna start today and just talk about <clears throat> what our role is as a speech language pathologist. So a lot of times we're known as the speech teacher. Um, we are the ones when um, children are having a hard time producing their R's or their S's or their L's. Um, that's oftentimes when um, we get referrals. Um, but I think a lot, a lot of times Others, um, other people don't realize that there's a lot of other things that we work on. So these are um, some of those service delivery areas that we can work on. So we work on um, fluency, language, cognition, resonance, um, voice and feeding and swallowing. So again, we're not just the speech teacher. There's a lot of things that um, speech language pathologists work on. And then here, I just wanted to kind of share, um, this is gonna be really important to kind of think about later on in the presentation, but when we talk about language, so when we go back and we're talking um, about all those service delivery areas, language is that area and, and SLPs are those, are, we are the language experts. But language, there's a lot that is incorporated within language. So with language, we can talk about um, spoken and written language as well as um, expressive receptive language and then all of these different domains of language. So phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, um, pragmatics, the way we use language, those pre-linguistic skills. So before children learn to talk, we um, they start to develop that joint attention, turn-taking, um, gestures, and then those paralinguistic, which are those nonverbal skills. So body language, facial expressions, and then of course literacy, which is why we're all here today. Um, so when we talk language, um, language is very broad, and these are some of those, and these are those areas that we that we work on. Um, so just a quick um, refresher on what is dyslexia, that definition. Um, so we know it's when our brain is processing language for how to learn and spell, um, how, how we learn um, how to read and spell, our brain is processing that differently. Um, and, the, and the breakdown typically is in that sound system of language, that phonological aspect of language. So when we go back and we were looking that previous slide at all those different domains of language, that first one we had listed there was phonology and that's the sound system of language. Um, and it's also important to remember that these kids often will have difficulties with their oral language skills, reading comprehension, spelling, um, and then of course their writing is affected. And then we also know that it's not related um, to their intellectual abilities. Um, so really quick before we get into this slide, there was a couple other polls that we're going to share. And so this one, um, the first poll, I believe, is going to be, so those parents that are here with us today um, that have children with dyslexia, we're curious to kind of see how many of them also had a delay in their speech and language skills. Okay, so about... 64, 36%. Okay, awesome, good to know. And that's kind of um, pretty consistent with what um, the research shows that um, they say anywhere, about 50% of kids with dyslexia also have a language disorder or it may also have a speech sound um, disorder. 
Um, another question, another, we have one more poll for the SLPs. Um, and even if you're a student, um, like an SLP student, um, how many of you currently have children on your caseload that you know, not necessarily treating for dyslexia, but speech and language, but they, you know, they also struggle with reading and writing. So, so far, so, um, so far, the seven people that responded, so 100% of those um, that are SLPs that are treating kids with speech and language disorders, they're also experiencing difficulty with reading and writing. Um, so here you can see those, excuse me, those early characteristics that we see um, in kids with dyslexia. Um, one of the biggest things that we always ask our parents is what if there was any family history of speech or language um, difficulties or learning difficulties. Um, I often don't specifically ask about dyslexia right away because um, eight times out of 10, I'm going to get no, you know, no one in the family has dyslexia. But then as I continue to talk to the families, um, it ends up coming out, well, um, you know, dad didn't really like school or dad kind of struggled um, in, in, you know, with reading um, or I myself, you know, I had a hard time, you know, with, with my writing. Um, but if you specifically ask about dyslexia, a lot of times you're going to get um, that answer that no, there is no family history of dyslexia. Um, and we know often because it, it, it doesn't get diagnosed. Um, another big characteristic is those are just the delayed speech and language skills. Um, difficulty learning shapes, colors, numbers, days of the week, um, or their letters. Difficulty learning um, new vocabulary. And then again, like the, that rhyming and those early phonological awareness skills. Something I really just like to point out when I um, am talking to other SLPs and parents is if you look at these early characteristics, these are these those early preschoolers that are getting referred for speech and language. So um, this is where our role as those as a speech language pathologist comes in really important in helping with that early identification because most of those early characteristics are those early speech and language um, difficulties. Um, so. Um, as kids get older in school, some other um, characteristics you might see, again, difficulty knowing they're right from left, they struggle with sight word recognition, poor spelling, um, difficulty memorizing number facts, frustration with schoolwork, um, and then also just like putting their ideas in writing is difficult or um, like their reading comprehension. Um, we'll talk about this too, but these are also those kids that are really struggling with like word finding, having the, the ability to really explain something um, in an organized manner or finding the right words to, to get their, their thoughts across. Um, so just when we, to talk briefly about developmental language disorders, um, some early characteristics of those that you might see for children um, that are younger that you might need to refer. Um, for language, but even again, those older students where you're, you're not quite sure, um, but you just feel like something might be going on. Um, these students have short ungrammatical sentences. They might have difficulty asking questions. Following multiple step directions or instructions in the classroom or even at home um, is hard for them and poor reading comprehension. Their stories, like their retells, if you were to ask them, how was your day at school today? And you know, they have a really hard time organizing or sequencing um, the events in their day, um, very limited details, or I don't know, I don't remember, um, is often what you might hear. Um, if they have a limited use of complex utterances, so like difficulty understanding even complex um, like written directions. So if they're having a hard time understanding um, like what um, is said to them in school might be hard. And then just overall, if they are frustrated with communicating, um, that's another big risk factor. Let's see here. Um, another something to really keep in mind though is um, these students, so all children with dyslexia do not necessarily have a developmental language disorder um, and vice versa, all children with developmental language disorders may not have dyslexia. Again, these are those kids um, that we really need to be watching out for, especially with referrals. Um, oftentimes our standardized assessments, SLPs that are um, with us today aren't, might not necessarily catch these kids and necessarily qualify them for services. But again, these are those um, students where they're having a really hard time, um, you know, maybe organizing their thoughts or, or finding those words, you know, their, their speech might be empty, you know, that one thing and, and you do this with it, um, that word finding is really hard. And then also they often are, um, uh, they use opposites a lot. So they get confused with, you know, we were talking about right and left. 
Um, so if they're like, oh, that fire is cold, when obviously they meant that, um, that it was hot. Um, and so those are, those are some good examples of students that might not necessarily be on our caseload, but we might get those referrals because teachers are, you know, they're, they just have a hard time. These are often those students where even um, the source that's referring them, whether it's the parent or their teacher, can't really explain what's going on. They're like, there's just something, there's just something going, there's just something there and that they know um, the child is having a hard time with. When we talk about speech sound disorders, so these this is kind of what we're we're really known for, and um, more people are familiar with. So oftentimes, those you just can't understand what they're saying. Um, so these are some examples of some pretty typical um, speech sound errors that you might see, um, like of a phonological disorder. Um, so they might shorten um, multisyllable words for so tomato for tomato. Um, one that I hear a lot is is Tendo for Nintendo, Attendo. Um, that's a common one we hear. Tup, so those kids that can't say those back sounds and they um, produce it with the front of their, their tongue. Tup, Da, so they're deleting that final sound. Um, tar for, or Ta for star, so maybe they're having a hard time with those R sounds, but then they, um, they often will delete um, one of those consonants in their blend. So instead of star, it's tar or top instead of stop. Um, again, that tate, like tate for cake, taupe. So those sounds that have that continuous airflow, they might be stopping those. And then also in more severe cases, they're still kind of at that reduplicated stage where they are just reduplicating that first syllable. So again, these are very common characteristics of speech sound disorders that will be referred for speech. Um, and again, like I mentioned, just because you have um, a speech sound disorder doesn't necessarily mean you, you have dyslexia, um, but it is one of those early characteristics. We know that that core deficit of dyslexia is in the phonological component, and it's the same here with um, speech sound disorders. But something you also really want to watch out for are those students that really struggle. They have, again, these are those kids, SLPs out there, they're not going to qualify when you give them um, the Arizona or the GFTA. They may not um, show up or, you know, fall far enough below to maybe necessarily qualify or even, you know, kind of be on, be on that radar, but when they're really struggling with those multisyllabic words, there's something going on with that phonological processing. Something again is off. Um, so for example, you might have a baschetti is a really common one um, that you hear. They really struggle just um, with that. They mix up sounds, transpose sounds within words. Um, these are some other examples I just have from um, like my students and even my, my own son has a hard time with some of these words. So um, and we probably hear this one a lot too, Hanizer or Hanitizer is another one I hear for hand sanitizer, um, san just sanitizer, but Hanizer is um, how one of my students produces um, for sanitizer. Um, Bovengers, my son is obsessed with superheroes and he calls them Bovengers and Webbins. So um, not weapons, but Webbins um, is how he produces that. Um, oat. That's another um, error my son makes a lot. Instead of eight, I ate cookies, I oat cookies. And it's interesting because he has turned, especially like his irregular past tense verbs, they all, um, he substitutes with the long O in them. Um, like he sloped on um, his bed last night instead of slept. So very interesting error patterns that these kids have. Um, a Donald's for McDonald's is one I've heard. And then the last one was interesting, a fleshens for instructions. Um, so again, you, you really like language samples are really good to get um, um, to kind of pick up on these errors because these are the type of errors that may not necessarily show up on just like a standardized articulation assessment. Um, so this is something we often hear as speech language pathologists, I think, um, when it comes to us working with kids with reading and um, spelling difficulties. And especially it just depends on the setting that you're in. But I think um, for us, it's really important to understand and recognize how important our role is, whether it be um, through just advocating parent and teacher training um, and assessment and intervention is definitely part of part of our scope and practice as well. So here, if you look at those elements of structured literacy um, for intervention for these students, um, and I've 
highlighted those spe those specifically those four language domains that we talked about at the beginning um, that fall under our our expertise are uh, in language phonology semantic syntax morphology um, so we really have a, a good understanding of these language skills to to better um, to train to train individuals and to and to help these students. And then the last piece just to kind of show too is when we look at all the skill areas um, of an assessment for dyslexia. Um, a lot of these are areas that we as SLPs are also assessing in our language um, our language test. So I, um, I think a lot of times we hear, you know, that, oh, well, we don't test for dyslexia, we can't test for dyslexia, when really, um, we are, we are already testing for dyslexia, um, we just may not realize or, or have um, the knowledge base to, I, to identify those characteristics. So I think that that's really important to see too, that a lot of these areas that we are um, looking for when we're looking, uh, trying to assess the child with dyslexia are assessments that we are giving already. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Anna Sosa, and she is going to share a little bit of information um, from her perspective as a parent. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Heather. It's so fun to hear you talk. You were in my very first graduate course I ever taught at NAU, however many years ago that was. And probably I use this picture here, the one on the lower left, which is my little guy, Sal, when he was... Um, just starting to produce his first words at about at about one year. Um, so my point in talking to you briefly is just to let you know that I'm an SLP. I'm an SLP with expertise specifically in phonology, in phonological disorders and speech sound disorders. And I knew nothing about dyslexia. And so I didn't recognize the signs. I did not recognize the signs <clears throat> in my son at the time. Here he is on the right, actually, that was last winter, um, age 12 seventh grade, preparing to receive his uh, student of the quarter award at, in middle school. Um, <laughs> very proud of him. He is not one of those, you know, ace the test, check all the boxes, perfect students, but he is a creative learner. And fortunately, his teachers recognize and appreciate differences. Um, so what I'm here to share with you are the red flags that I saw, but I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know how to interpret them. And it wasn't until the end of second grade that I actually figured out what dyslexia was and what was going on. Um, and as Heather talked about, so mixing up sounds and words, he definitely had speech delay, but fortunately that I knew how to take care of. So I was able to provide therapy and remediate that pretty quickly. Um, but just funny errors. So if you're familiar with Flagstaff, we have two institutions in town. We have a coffee shop called Late for the Train, and a pizza shop called Fratelli's. And he would always talk about wanting to go to late for the Tellies. No idea if we wanted a gingerbread cookie from the coffee shop or a slice of pizza. Um, we also have a ski area where he started skiing at about age two called Snowbowl. And then we also have a Barnes and Noble in town. And he would always talk about wanting to go to Barnes and Snowbowl. <laughs> and I think he meant the bookstore most of the time when he was talking about that. Um, love to be read to, absolutely love to be read to, but could not fill in a rhyme to save his life. So nursery rhymes that we'd read hundreds of times. We'd be looking at the picture book of a mouse running up a big clock, and I'd say, hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the tower, or wooden thing. <laughs> he could not fill in that clock, even though he'd heard it a million times. Um, could not learn the names of the letters. So at some point, probably around age three, I think I, we both just got so frustrated that we packed up all the alphabet magnets and letter puzzles we had around and just threw them in the trash so we wouldn't be frustrated um, anymore. Um, difficulty learning, as Heather mentioned, those signs, difficulty learning, numbers, days of the week, colors, and probably my favorite example of not just the weakness and difficulty learning these names for things, but also the creative brain <laughs> and the strengths, which is he got so frustrated with people asking him what color things were, because he was always, I mean, he knew all the names. He could list 10, 15 colors, but couldn't put the right one with the right color, and he knew he couldn't. And so you would ask him what color something was, and he got so frustrated with it that he finally just started answering rainbow. <laughs> Whenever anybody asked him what color something was, it's rainbow, because he couldn't be wrong if he answered rainbow. Um, so those are just some of the early signs, and that's even you know before 
reading instruction and writing instruction started. And then things became a lot more obvious um, at that point. But this is just to point out that if you're a parent, it's likely that you didn't recognize these signs either. And I, as an SLP, came out of graduate school knowing nothing about dyslexia. Um, fortunately, I had the opportunity <laughs> to learn a lot, and now I can share that with my students. And one of my main goals is to make sure that all of my students who are coming through both undergraduate and graduate school are not going to leave graduate school without those, the ability to recognize those signs and then also know what to do about it, um, which, as Heather said, is uh, a huge part of our role. And I certainly <clears throat> think back on students that I had when I was working um, at an elementary school and know that many of them had dyslexia. They didn't have the label. I didn't know what it was and wasn't providing the best support that I could for them. So with that, I think we can turn it over to questions. Fantastic. So I'm going to give everyone in the audience's chance to think of questions that you have. And while you're thinking about maybe a certain situation or scenario that you have, maybe it's a student, maybe it's your own child, um, I have a couple of questions already. So can SLPs diagnose dyslexia? I'm not sure who wants to start that one. Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> there go. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> SLPs can diagnose dyslexia. As Heather pointed out, so much of the testing we're already doing can give us the answer to that question. Um, and we can formally diagnose dyslexia. Um, I would say I would like to have a more thorough um, psychoeducational evaluation to go together with our assessment that we're doing. Um, but I think that we can and we should definitely be part of the team when dyslexia is being, uh, is suspected. Heather, you wanna to add to that? Um, no, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I also think SLPs can diagnose dyslexia, um, but that, that um, team approach is so important to really get a full picture um, of the child. So. What literature would you recommend for better understanding dyslexia and roles of SLPs in general? Great question. Um, we, there is um, a dyslexia forum on uh, Asha, I can't remember the name of the journal off the top of my head, um, and I don't know if you, I think, um, we'll share that, that'll be part of the resources that you'll get, but that um, that's going to be a really helpful resource for you. Um, I also really like the books for, by David Kilpatrick, um, Dr. David Kilpatrick, he has a couple of books for assessment. Um, also equipped for reading success is another book that he has. Um, Dr. Sally Shea would say just came out with the second edition of Overcoming Dyslexia and that's another um, really good uh, resource. Um, there's a few others, I can't think of any more off the top of my head, but those are, we. you will be getting a list of resources within the next week after the presentation and um, we'll have lots of resources on there for you. So part of this next question um, or, or really a request, can you help those in the audience um, understand that dyslexia is a language-based learning disorder. Can you um, maybe bridge that? And maybe that, maybe that kind of goes into that philosophy of, you know, stay in your lane, that, you know, there's speech and language and then there's dyslexia. Can you, um, you know, spend a little time talking about how, how they're related is someone's question here. I'll start. <laughs> um, as Heather pointed out in her in her talk, you know, dyslexia in most cases is the core problem that really interferes with learning to read and spell is phonological. It's sound based, and so and phonology is a core part of of language. Um, so difficulty with that processing um, and establishing sort of underlying language sound representations for words and language is really what makes it difficult to to read and write and to map that phonological information onto the letters. <clears throat> um, so often I think we misinterpret dyslexia as being a visual um, issue and 
it, and it can look like that. I can understand why, because sometimes it really looks like that where kids are just, they seem to even have trouble understanding, you know, the letters or recognizing the letters. So it seems visual, but it's amazing um, to see just how tied it is to language and specifically to phonology. And I, I would just give an example of, um, you know, you don't have to be a speech language pathologist to provide structured literacy for students. Um, uh, there's lots of excellent tutors and reading specialists that provide fantastic services. But what I do find in working with the kids that we work with, that we have a special skill set as speech language pathologists that can tackle some things that, that creep in that a reading specialist um, may not be able to recognize uh, and know how to, how to help with. And that those are those language-based things. And then as we continue through the the reading intervention, you know, we realize that, oh, the student is also struggling with morphology and with vocabulary and with word retrieval and all of these language-based things that we have the ability to be able to help with in addition to the structured literacy. And Heather, I know you probably have stuff to add to that. No, I think you um, hit the nail on the head um, a bit again. I think, I think the, I, that misconception that dyslexia is more of a vision deficit is where people have a hard time understanding how it's language based. Um, and I think once you you get that understanding and, and you can see, um, you know, that relationship with the sound system of language, then you kind of start to understand and make that connection of how it's how it's more of um, a language based disorder and and not vision. Fantastic. So. Do you think first grade is too early to identify dyslexia? No. <laughs> um, um, you, again, if you look at those er early characteristics that we talked about, um, I mean, you can identify those early characteristics as early as four. I mean, and like Anna said, um, I think her, um, her sharing her experience as an as an SLP and a parent in recognizing those um, red flags in her son when he was three, four years mm -hmm. old um, may not necessarily be diagnosed with dyslexia at that point, but at that point you can start intervening um, with those early phonological um, skills to to help with that. So um, first grade absolutely is not too early. Those um, characteristics and early warning signs are, are showing up as early as preschool and kindergarten. Fantastic. Where would you start with therapy? Um, the question goes on to ask teaching phonological awareness. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's the place to start. So if I had recognized those signs, and Heather's absolutely right, I'm now thinking back as early as age two, there were some of those signs, three, certainly four. What would I have done if I had recognized and known? And probably I was doing some of this already. But you start with phonological awareness, really working intensely on phonological awareness um, and then and phonemic awareness and then explicit instruction. So while I threw the letters out because I was just so frustrated, um, now I would know to provide, you know, start early with that very explicit instruction and in teaching the letters and the sounds. Um, so you can start in, in, in preschool with that um, structured literacy, the early stages of the structured literacy um, steps. Are there any programs, games, activities that you would frequently recommend to parents to engage with their children? Um, in terms of that question, like for early, early preschool kids is kind of like what I'm thinking of. And um, I'm not sure if this is what you are looking for, but um, any, like, like Anna said, some of those early, you know, nursery rhymes, books, things like that um, are very helpful. But really just working on still like those early phonological awareness skills. So syllable segmentation, um, we do lots of like at my house, we like to do um, games where we, you know, clap out words to recognize sounds and syllables. Um, 
the same, like even in, in therapy, I, we work on a lot of just like identification of how many words are in sentences. So, so those early phonological awareness skills, my big thing is lots of like engagement and activity movement. We like to do hops, claps, um, you know, and get the child up and moving. Um, that I find is really helpful and engaging for them in terms of um, like learning letters and sounds. Um, I think, like Anna said, doing more explicit instruction with them, trying to make it as engaging and fun as you can. Um, I always think I like we like to find um, letters like on the wall with our flashlight um, that we've that we've explicitly taught. That's another thing is um, make sure you know you're only you try to practice in therapy. We try we practice those those letters that we've only explicitly taught them in our sessions, um, and we don't ever assume that they like already know some of it. Um, so I don't know if that's kind of what you're looking for and if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I would say. I know there are lots of like programs and books that are sold um, for that parents can pick up and work through. And I'm not terribly familiar with most, with any of those actually, um, and what the quality of those. So I can't speak to that directly, but definitely what Heather was saying in terms of working you know, games and rhymes and activities with just paying attention to sounds um, and sounds and words. But one thing I do want to point out is that while phonemic awareness and phonological awareness is necessary in order to learn how to read effectively, it's not the end all. It's not sufficient. <laughs> yeah, so you need to have that phonological awareness, but you can't stop there with a student with dyslexia. So a student without dyslexia, if they've developed their phonological awareness, they're going to learn to read and write pretty easily, which unfortunately is why we don't have structured literacy in the classroom, because a large proportion of students are doing okay without it. They would all benefit from it, but a large portion are doing okay without it. But I think that's also sometimes a misconception, and even among, I think, a lot of SLPs that, oh, if we just work on phonological awareness and make sure he has strong phonemic awareness, then he'll learn how to read. And in most cases with a student with dyslexia, that's not the case. We then need to move into the next steps of the structured literacy um, program. What might you do for a student who can name a letter and a keyword, say the sound, especially when the picture is given, but cannot do this um, task such as naming the sound or the letter without those um, supports in place? Should a student like that be referred for speech evaluation? Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure if I understand the question um, entirely. So, I think what they're saying is, like, if they're shown the picture, like the keyword. I, I'm. I'm picturing phonogram cards. So, like, if you have a the letter on it, and they can tell you, like, um, b bat b. But then if the picture is not shown, if you show them the letter by itself, can they not say the sound? Um, right. And vice versa, if they say the sound, then if you would say what letter says B and they can't write it. I'm wondering if it's like they're not retaining it. So they can do it with a cue, but they can't do it without some sort of um, supports in place. So it's it's maybe not coming together as, as quickly. Um, and so, uh, this was from an anonymous, this was an anonymous question. So okay. if there's more to add to the question, please feel free to type that in and we'll try to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and yes, I would say, you know, those, that is, um, an area that I would consider an early, if they're having a hard time retaining or in remembering and identifying those sounds and letters, and they definitely need to be referred, um, for an evaluation or at least a screening to see kind of what else, um, what might be what might be going on. But the fact that if they're not retaining um, those sounds and letters, um, then yeah, that's a, another characteristic that we look for. Yeah, and I would say that that's not one we talked about necessarily, but another characteristic is consistently inconsistent. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. um, which is, so yeah, needing those cues and they can do it on one page and then on the very next page, it seems like they've never seen that word or that letter before. Yeah. Um, and so what we want to do, it's great if you've got those cues built in so that they can use those cues to under to access their, their knowledge. Keep the cues, keep the cues there, whether it's visual cues or auditory cues. So when we're doing our structured literacy programs, you know, we've got the letter tiles available to them at all times. And we've built in hand gestures and movement cues to help support their, their learning. So it's providing everything that they need to be successful over and over and over and over again 
which is what will allow them to be able to ultimately do it without the cues. But keeping those cues in there is, is the instructional um, method that we use. Awesome. What role does link what role does the language barrier play when identifying dyslexia? Go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I understand the question either. Um, either. Um, so again, I mean, I, and I had I don't know if I'm I'm answering your question, so I apologize up front for that. So what role does the language difficulty play? Um, in identifying dyslexia. Uh, certainly if the child has both language delay, language disorder, developmental language disorder, and dyslexia, um, the, the language disorder may be adding to the dyslexia. So on, on top of difficulty with the decoding and being able to sound out words, then just being able to understand those words is going to layer on, on, top, of, on top of the dyslexia component. Um, so it, it adds another layer of difficulty um, for kids who have both. And I don't know if that's the answer to your question. Anna, do you, what about for English language learners? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a great question. We can identify it because <laughs> interestingly, one of those skills that transfers from one language to another language is phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. So if let's say, You've got a student who's been, you know, exposed only to Spanish until the time that they hit kindergarten. Um, they should have been developing their phonological awareness skills and their phonemic awareness skills in Spanish, and that should transfer to English when they start learning English. In fact, develop pretty quickly. And so, if you're seeing difficulties with phonemic awareness and phonological awareness, um, that's a red flag, even for an English language learner who doesn't have a lot of experience um, with English. So you can definitely. Uh, ideally, you would want to look at it in, in the first language and see if they're struggling with it in the first language. But if they're developing adequately in the first language, um, then that should transfer to English. Next one is, I'm curious if, as SLPs, do we ever support or incorporate working memory when working with a child with dyslexia? Does working memory have any role in any of this? Um, working memory plays a big role in um, these students with, with language disorders and with dyslexia. So um, absolutely, um, definitely incorporate in working on um, strategy training and different, different ways to um, help the child over, overcome and work and work through those working memory deficits. And I think even just those students like we were talking about earlier, those kids that aren't retaining um, letter sounds and words, um, that's, a, that's a big part of it. Anna, do you have anything specific to add? No, I'm not really, but yeah, absolutely. Working memory is so often a part of a part of the, the the cognitive profile having some difficulties. I have found, and I haven't measured it directly, so this is more anecdotal. But I think some of the structured literacy activities that we do actually indirectly support working memory. Um, you know, so we're asking kids to listen to sounds and hold those sounds in their head and then repeat those sounds and then maybe get rid of one sound and put another sound in there and then and then sequence those sounds um, as we move up through the programs you know through the instruction then we're asking them to listen to a word and then break that word into the syllables and then into the sounds and then retain those sounds and bring them down so we're doing a lot of supporting of working memory and i do feel like as i'm working with kids i see their working memory getting stronger particularly for the for the those tasks that we're asking them to do. Yeah, I agree. This is a question from a parent. She says, my own daughter describes letters as dancing on the page. Do you hear this with children that you work with? So almost like a visual, like they, the words tend to move on the page. I've heard people say that and I've heard people describe that. I have not had any of my students actually say that to me or the, or the adults that I work with. Um, but I have heard it, but it's not something that I regularly hear from my students. That I work with. Yeah, same, same. I've had other people more so like when I've done like talks and presentations like this, I've had like I, I had one person tell me one time that they had to, um, the only way they were able to read is if they laid upside down on their 
bed. And so, but I don't, I don't currently have any students that, um, that report this. And then um, I think this was a clarification, a bit of a clarification. So the, the question that we were um, addressing earlier about not being able to retain the information, um, this professional says there's no, well, I'm assuming it's professional, maybe parent, but, um, no retention of sounds and letters at all. So um, if you want to either add another little point in there or clarify anything, if the student isn't retaining any of the letter sounds um, or names at all, if there's that's um, that. I, th I think kind of like just what we said that definitely is, um, you know, a, a characteristic, one of those early um, identifiers. And like Anna said, consistently, you know, inconsistent. Um, and maybe one day they have it and then the next day they just they can't do it. So definitely something that I would um, keep my eye on or refer out for a screening. And then this one says, I am a C-A-L-T in private practice. I have several students with some speech and language disorders as well as dyslexia. Can you recommend resources to help me address specifically word retrieval, dropping, or adding sounds? <laughs> I don't have any resources. I think, I think this is one of those places where the training that an SLP has can be really helpful. So if I have students adding sounds or dropping sounds, I can reach back into my tool bag as, as, as an SLP working with speech sound disorder and use some of those strategies that I have and also allow me to kind of analyze what is it that they're leaving out? Is it voiced sounds at the ends of words and clusters that they're having difficulty with that we can work on? Um, so I think that, that's if students are doing having difficulty just with the sounds, um, then that's something where an SLP could be really useful um, to add to that team working working with that student. Yeah, I agree, um, and I I think it's really um, it's hard when you get types of questions like that because there's so many factors that could go into place, and so it's hard to give specific resources if we don't really know um, you know the specifics of of you know, those speech errors. So I love this next question. So I feel like we spend a lot of time talking about early identification, you know, the what happens in those earlier grades. Um, and this question comes from a parent of a teenage daughter. Daughter is 14. And the question is, is there a way to improve their reading and speech? And is there more that can be done besides just, I'm assuming, uh, phonological awareness therapies? Phonotherapies is how it was how it was worded. If I'm understanding, so this is a teenage student with dyslexia or with difficulty reading who hasn't gotten structured literacy. Absolutely, you can start a structured literacy program. I, we've just taken on uh, five eighth grade students um, this year who had never gotten appropriate intervention and they're making fantastic progress and really gaining confidence um, in their, in their basic reading ability. So absolutely, um, starting a structured literacy program of, of some sort at this point um, would be very beneficial. In fact, I'm working with a 35 year old right now who never got structured literacy. Um, and she, just having worked with her for a few months, her confidence has really um, improved and she's just feeling good about it. Is the Wilson reading system, an example of structured literacy. So maybe we should um, define what structured literacy is for those in the, in the audience today. Sorry about that, I was reading something else. Can you repeat of the Of course. Question? Uh, the question is, is Wilson reading system an example of structured literacy? So I think we should probably define what structured literacy is for those who are not familiar with that in the audience. Yeah, so going back, um, I'm not specifically, I'm not familiar with Wilson 
um, reading program, but I believe it is. Um, they, when you think about structured literacy, I think we shared a slide with that earlier and, and it just, you have those components of, you know, phonology, um, morphology, syntax, semantics, sound letter representation and syllables as, you know, though, those are those key elements that need to be included in any structured literacy program. And even if it's not a, a specific program, like in your intervention, um, those are the elements that should be. So yes, um, Wilson, I believe is, is considered uh, a structured literacy program, sorry. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And it's probably the one I see most often if schools, if the special ed department of the school does have some kind of structured literacy program, Wilson is often the one um, that they have. Um, one thing I, I would say about a structured literacy program is Heather defined it, all the components that it needs to have. One of the things that is built into it is that we're never asking our students to do anything that we haven't explicitly taught them to do. Um, and this is how I can get my middle school and high school students on board is by promising them <laughs> that I'm not going to tell them to try reading it or just just try it or to sound it out if I haven't explicitly taught them the exact skill that I'm asking them to do. Um, and so that's another important component of structured literacy. Awesome. We have a question that asks, do you think using different colored visuals helps with learning phonological awareness during reading? So different like colored overlays or, or for the visual aspect? Um, I mean, as far as you're talking about phonological, that's a phonological awareness question. Um, some people do say that you know, using different visual overlays might help. That's very individual to each student, but using any kind of multi-sensory information to build. So um, using visual, different colored tiles to represent different sounds is absolutely something that we do. And for, for example, we might use one color tile to represent consonant sounds and another color tile to represent vowel sounds. So we're, we're just trying to support with as many senses as possible. So in that in that regard, using different um, colors might um, would be beneficial. And then do you think that it would be helpful, especially for those that are sort of new to dyslexia, to address that it's not a visual challenge? Um, if you could speak to that a little bit, because we are talking so much about the you know, speech and language aspect and how it is part of uh, a language disorder, would you mind addressing um, very briefly how there's a misconception about what people I mean, see? I don't, besides kind of what we've already mentioned, I just because that's not my area of, you know, expertise or my specialty, I don't know um, enough. I don't feel um, well versed in, you know, a visual processing deficit or um, any sort of like visual deficit to really go into more detail about that. But just what I know about language and what we know about these kids with um, language based learning difficulties kind of is what we've already said is how it ties more back into, um, you know, the research has shown in that that sound system of language. Um, and, you know, the morphology, this, the semantics, vocabulary, syntax, um, and not necessarily. Now, that doesn't mean that a child with dyslexia might not have, you know, difficulties with visual processing or, or other things, um, but we know that's not the root cause of their dyslexia. So, um, but that, that's really, I, I can't really say too much else about um, specifically visual processing disorders. That's fantastic. So that is all we have time for right now for the session and questions and answers. If you have other questions, you know, feel free to um, send us emails and we'll try to maybe compile a list of resources. And if we can answer them, if they're not too specific, um, you know, we'll put that out there with the rest of the resources that we'll share after this chat. Mary is Thank you, Mary. Mary's fantastic and puts all that together behind the scenes. So I'm gonna switch it over to um, the portion where we're gonna give stuff away. <laughs> so the first thing that I would love for us to give away is a membership to our branch, AZIDA. So the first person to put your first and last name into the Q&A, um, we will make a note of it and we will give a free membership. And I've got Heather, Milligan. 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 the first one. 
Congratulations, Heather. Okay, so I'm gonna clear these out. Okay, and the next thing we wanna give away is a t-shirt. Um, so we have several uh, sizes left still within our, um, with our, our stockpile of t-shirts. So the first person to write your first and last name into the Q&A, we will send a t-shirt. I had Lori Martin was the first one. Congratulations, Lori. <laughs> okay, so for this next one, um, we are going to give away a $25 gift card to Starbucks. So, but we're gonna have you work for it a little bit. <laughs> so if you can name the first person who can name at least three skills that should be assessed with um, as part of the presentation with speech and language and dyslexia. All right. So the first like Samantha got it. Samantha Peterson. Congratulations to Samantha. That's excellent. Current, oh. current student at NAU. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. So if you wouldn't mind, Heather, I think you have control of the presentation. If you want to put up the last slide, we just want to um, say thank you to everyone who joined us this morning. Sorry about the little bit of a technical glitch that we had. Hopefully everybody was able to sign back on and, and join us for this chat. Um, we do, and, and we do appreciate so much both Anna and Heather for joining us today and sharing all of your expertise with us. It was, it was incredible. I know I learned a lot. I'm hoping everybody out in the audience feels the same way. Um, we do have another chat coming up.